If you're having trouble or know someone who is suffering from fear, the schematic on your screen may prove useful to you. Uh, we'll be talking fast as I get going. We have a lot of information to cover. I will also cite some literature that I may not read through, but you can look back at the recording. Well, that's a picture of Chicago's lakefront, and I practice on in the north suburb of Winneka. I have been practicing uh, since 1985 in private practice. I'm a general dentist, and my focus is on comprehensive patient-centered dentistry. It relates to our general health. I dedicate a lot of my time resolving complex cases, and very often they tend to be class two dentitians that have ongoing concerns after orthodontics and or other restorative and cosmetic dental treatment. Today, I'll be speaking mostly about how splint therapy can be utilized to aid in diagnosis and comprehensive treatment. So my journey started uh, basically when I was about three years out of dental school. Uh, I was a little frustrated because I thought dentistry was the coolest thing in the world and things started getting kind of boring and I was getting a little confused when some more complicated things came along and I'd prep a second molar and I'd make my temporary in the lab. We used to use a acrylic, you'd have to go to your lab and make it and come back to the room and I'd look back and the patient was biting on the crown I had just prepared. And I knew I took two millimeters off. I'm certainly the type of person who will measure more than once before I cut something. Uh, so anyway, I was wondering what was going on and I was getting a little frustrated and uh, my business manager accountant uh, suggested that he knew some dentist that he worked with that uh, had gone seen Boston speak and had gone to the Paint Institute. So started on my journey uh, with the, these great education facilities. So I consider Panky uh, my ground zero point because it gave me such a well-balanced uh, education. I thought I was going there for technical learning and I learned more about myself and my patients uh, and realized that I really needed to focus on other things than just the technical so that I could be. So that, that makes quite a difference in uh, many of the people I've seen, the way they practice. Uh, the people to the right are one of the first study groups uh, that uh, I was involved with and uh, Dr. Richard Green was basically brought out of uh, clinical teaching retirement uh, to help facilitate and with a number of other people that had studied under Henry Tanner. And so these became great experiential learning groups. And from that, and I write down the word family tree because uh, to my knowledge, most of the groups that have become quite large uh, have emanated really from this beginning of a study model group. And so thank you to all those people who were before us and taking care of us. So closure statement, I'm not being paid to present this lecture, though at times I do earn an honorarium for my teaching and for my facilitation of study groups. I've not altered any images of my clinical dentistry. I'll be touching lightly on many subjects, all of which are worthy of many hours of discussion, of which we don't have time for today. Especially one thing that I think is very important is sleep apnea. That's a very big part. I don't want you to ignore that when you're doing splint therapy. Uh, you could monitor any changes. Uh, and so to monitor changes, you have to monitor people before you do splint therapy. Please feel, feel free to email, email me anytime in the future to discuss paths for furthering your continuing education. And since we are limited on time, there are many of you out there, your questions are welcome via the chat box. And if appropriate, I will try to address them in the presentation. We'll also leave time at the end of the presentation to discuss questions. And again, you're welcome to email me at any time. So education comes from within you. Uh, so said Napoleon Hill. You have to struggle and you have to use effort and thought. Well, and if you're not making any mistakes, you're probably not trying hard enough. It is important to understand that it's a learning process. I am still learning 35 years of dentistry and it, I, I just cannot believe how much more there is to do and learn. It's just, uh, we are the luckiest people in our careers. So this is my objective today. I'm going to, uh, I don't want to miss anything. This is a splint drawn by me electronically over the photographic image. It is representative of transferred learning, and it is a primary objective of this lecture. We've spent countless hours with small groups of dentists who have invested their time in educating themselves. That they haven't found anybody who's been able to master this in a weekend course. Learning comes a step at a time, so you do not feel intimidated or overwhelmed if it takes more time than initially anticipated. 
but we can generalize about certain case types of patient treatment. Each patient presents with their unique circumstances, perspectives, and temperament. The reason I have a particular affection for splint therapy is this has helped me slow down and develop a better understanding of the behavioral needs of my patients, as well as clarifying their technical needs. I learn more about who a patient is, how teeth function, and how adaptive a somatic nathic system can be from utilizing splint therapy than any other form of education. Have you ever wished you hadn't started treatment on a patient? Well, there are some patients that are just simply more challenging than others. And splint therapy has certainly helped me make those decisions and when I can go ahead and treat. So it reduced my risk on the patients I treated. The goal of the webinar is for you to understand how splint therapy can allow you to design your occlusal and restorative plan in a reversible manner. This particular splint you see on your screen was used in a case we will discuss today. So these are things that uh, hopefully I'll be able to demonstrate today. And that's what's great about working at, in, in groups where you actually have hands-on learning exercises. And sometimes we have to unlearn what we've learned to be able to have our minds open. And if you only the only tool you have is a hammer, you tend to see every problem as a nail. Well, son here uh, came back, was quite dismayed that my daughter uh, had taken our chess pieces. My son and I were ready to play a chess game and she came in the room, unbeknownst to us, and dressed all our chess pieces with poly pockets. Well, she had a different paradigm. So things that we'll be needing to discuss today is know your patient behaviorally and uh, L.D. Panky, who uh, was the institute was actually started on his behalf not by L.D. Panky. Uh, often like to say I've never seen a tooth walk into my office. Comprehensive co-examination and the emphasis is on co-examination. Uh, you need to be doing the discovery process with your patient. Your gums and muscle. Evaluate the pathology relative to the age of the patient. Evaluate the nature of the existing occlusion. Learn how to trial equilibrate articulated casts and test your proposed changes in a reversible manner, such as splint therapy for your provisionals. And finally, transfer the learning from the splint to your occlusal scheme. How we define health and successful treatment depends upon how we define symptoms. Are your questions you're asking your patients deep enough? Are you asking enough questions to get the symptoms? The signs, are those things that you examine and evaluate on a patient? Are you just looking at their teeth and tissues? Or are you palpating muscles and jaw joints? How are you doing that? And pathology, what do we consider pathology? When is a tooth so worn that we consider it pathologic? Well, for those who are golfers uh, out there, probably know this is not your typical pro golf swing. Um, however, it is effective, believe it or not. This is my good friend, and he's a wonderful dentist and a great educator, and has, I'm sure many of you know him, Dr. Todd Davis. And as you can see, it's no surprise he has some neck trouble. Uh, but Todd uh, can hit the ball a country mile, and very often it lands in the fairway. So. As with splints, it doesn't have to look pretty to be functional. Same with occlusion, it does not have to look pretty. It's not about just dots and lines, it's about how the muscles work and how things function, how the patient's doing. So we have all kinds of different splints we can be looking at. We, we have small segmental splints, splints that can be anterior, posterior, all depends what you're looking for. Uh, so there's, there's no necessarily right and wrong about any splint, just know what you're doing with it and what you're evaluating what you're testing out with the patient. So this is our first patient we'll talk about, Lynn. Uh, Lynn was a patient uh, referred to me by one of my neighboring dentists and uh, she had come in with, into my office with significant pain. And so I asked her what kind of pain she had. She said, well, it feels like I need another root canal, but my dentist said he thinks it may be something else. So she told me her story that basically over the last five years or so, she'd present with some pain. She was diagnosed with a cracked tooth. Uh, she would have 
uh, endodontic therapy, and then she'd have a crown place. And the pain went away. Well, six months or so later, the pain would come back. Another tooth, same thing would happen, and on and on and on for several years. Well, what do you think the teeth look on the other side of her mouth? Just put a picture in your head. Well, they're virtually virgin teeth. And I asked her, were your teeth on your right side of your mouth similar to this? And she said, yes. So clearly uh, something was awry. And so what I do with every patient, basically, every single patient that comes in my office almost for a new patient exam, when we get into this discussion and they're ready, they have to be ready to and willing to be doing this, I ask if I can put a little anterior to programmer in their mouth. And so I put a little dental compound. These are prefabricated devices. There's a variety of these. You can make all kinds of different devices as you wish. And this is what I use. It's a little dental compound, put it in their mouth. And I had her sit for about 15 minutes while I went on and did a couple hygiene exams. Came back to the room and Lynn was fine. She said, my pain's completely gone. She was very surprised. I wasn't as surprised, but I was delighted to see that uh, this worked for her. So what it was, was basically she had referred pain from her muscles. This schematic is a uh, from Janet Travell's trigger point manual, and I won't go into the specifics uh, of it, but uh, there is a lot of referred pain from muscle that goes directly to the teeth. So oftentimes when we may think it's endodontic nature and the symptoms sound very similarly, that it can be coming from elsewhere. So now we'll take a look at Lynn again, and here's her maximum interpuspation bite. This is where she was after I took that anterior programmer out. I just had her close lightly down on her own, took the device out, and that's where she was at. And I took a picture. And so I encouraged her to uh, start some uh, co-examination work and come back and we set up a new appointment. So basically what I did was find a, for the day at least, where her centric relation was. We don't know that necessarily is that point, but at least was close enough and she was relaxed there. So you can go there with or without you. Centric relation doesn't have to be manipulated. It's a position of freedom, relaxation, and it's a neuromuscular harmony of teeth, joints, and muscles. It's independent of tooth contact in which the condyles articulate in the anterior superior position against the posterior slopes of the articular eminences. Centric occlusion is when the teeth actually touch each other. It's the same arc of closure of centric relation, and this may or may not coincide with maximum intercuspal position. And we have maximum intercuspal position, which is basically the acquired bite, and uh, also when you can wrist the late models together. So for predictable occlusion, we need to have a method of getting our CR bites or CO bite records, room pass, articulators, baseball or facial plane analyzers, excursive records so that you can set the condylar guidance, and of course, uh, do a co-examination as we did before. What about myomonitors during this, if you want to do evaluation with them? I will tell you personally, uh, I don't use them because they're often not as repeatable when you look back at them, at least that's my understanding when you several months out. But anyway, they don't uh, work on all of the muscles of the masticatory system. So uh, I'd rather not depend on something of this sort and just a uh, comments at the end there, all clinicians who use them to be cautious and to recognize their limitations can be used. I understand that, and, uh, and, but I would just say there is some limitations to use. So what about articulators? Well, it really makes a big difference when you have smaller jaw people uh, as far as where you put the cast in the articulator. A simple hinge articulator, we have a more vertical movement. The mandible moves more vertically up and down with very little horizontal component. When we use a Archon or semi-adjustable articulator, uh, we have a pathway of the mandible moving more on an arc. There's a more anterior component to that movement. So when we look at in, in the left arrow, that demonstrates where teeth would be in the articulator in a small jaw with a baseball or ear bow, and we have a larger horizontal or anterior posterior movement. In the larger jaw, we have a smaller anterior posterior. So it does make a difference in your treatment planning. 
And this is that you need your modular eminential. So here's Lynn again. Here's her maximum intercuspation, and here's her temporary occlusion. Uh, if you look at the maximum intercuspation, you can see she's sort of class one, and her canines in the posterior and her canines are in a edge to edge and a half step class two. In centric occlusion, she's basically in a half step class two, meaning her cusp is riding over each other like it goes to the side. So she has a large anterior posterior slide. And this schematic shows uh, the red dot is the, the axis of centric urethra. And we can see the downward and forward, forward movement of the mandible when he bites the MIT. So think of uh, your, uh, around every joint you have antagonistic muscles. And what that means is they work in opposite directions, but they have to work in harmony with each other. So your arm has a bicep and tricep, when you contract your bicep, your tricep relaxes and vice versa. So on the jaw, the inferior belly of the pterygoid uh, has to relax than when the elevator muscles are working. So that's the inferior belly of the pterygoid. It's relaxing, we close. And then when we don't have harmony and we have a hidden slide, the anterior uh, or the inferior belly of the anterior pterygoid has to uh, contract, which means that the elevator muscles have to overpower the downward movement. So that causes a disharmony in the system. Something is going to give it maybe the teeth, joints, or muscles. So Lynn fortunately had an occlusal appliance, so I asked her to bring it back when she came back uh, for treatment, and I used her occlusal appliance, cut off the wires that were on it, and I relined it. I strongly advise relining all splints with fresh acrylic on the patient don't want any squishing or rocking of the splint. It's very important for proprioception that that splint is very stable. That's a key thing with your splint. And I'll just mention quickly, that's why soft splints don't work as well. They cause more muscle activity. The, the proprioception is just not as consistent. So this, this was her treatment. I did this over 20 years ago for Lynn, and she still wears the splint at night, and she has never needed it. So splint design, it can be used for occlusal muscle pain, it can be used for restorative decisions and CO verification. So you can choose different types of splints depending on what you're trying to do. Here's a severely worn dentition. And uh, Dan's wife didn't like the way, I'll go back, didn't like the way uh, he was, his teeth were disappearing. So I apologize for not having uh, pictures until he was already in his ortho and already had his uh, surgically facilitated orthodontic uh, treatment. Uh, so in other words, uh, he had surgery to help speed up the orthodontic intrusion of his anterior teeth. That's how we got the plate open. We wanted to make his teeth longer, so we made it open. Well, I also wanted a test to make sure that when I was going to restore him, what types of restorations he used. So I put composite on his teeth while he was in orthodontic treatment. And that was a splint. The orthodontist gave me permission to do this at this time. We coordinated with how much intrusion we wanted to do and other movement. We were also getting the gingival uh, collars at the right height uh, for aesthetic reasons. So through that time, Dan wore those uh, composite temporaries as a splint. And probably over nine months, he didn't chip anything. He wore them down a little here or there so we could see some uh, bruxism patterns he had. But generally speaking, it was very successful. So from that, this is the day of cementation. That's why the tissues are a little irritated, but he had six veneers on the maxillary anterior. This is a position on the bottom and two veneers on 24, 25. Otherwise I did some very fine light equilibration of the lower teeth, reducing the teeth uh, to level the plane of occlusion. Give him some nice landing areas. We'll be talking more about that. Uh, so here's a seat of veneers and Dan's looking a lot better in 20 feet. He's very happy. Uh, and I give him a splint afterward so that he wears that at night. He certainly still has some bruxing issues, but not, not that bad. Uh, but so I make a maxillary splint in this case because that's where the veneers are at. I want to protect those veneers as much as possible. Here's Kay. So this is a patient when I first showed her a number of years ago. People said, hey, she's got airway issues. Well, I wasn't listening. So listen, some people have airway issues. Uh, and Kay was one of those people. Uh, 
And, but I did not treat her when she has moved to New York, but I certainly have discussions with her and uh, occasionally do see her every few years. I'm through Chicago. She was 16, referred to me to, by an orthodontist. The orthodontist had treated her for three years. Uh, Kay, was in, Kay was not completely finished by the orthodontist, but she was in miserable pain and she was having joint discomfort. And so the orthodontist asked me if I could do anything because Kay was, had nowhere else to go. She had seen the headache clinics. She didn't want to have orthodontic surgery. She was advised to do that by uh, some other dentist. And anyway, her teeth were, they looked beautiful. They were virtually virgin teeth. A little bit of wear on her uh, second molars, not much. So here's her maximum intercuspation. Not terrible. Uh, she doesn't have anterior coupling, but uh, the orthodontist was really working hard by trying to change a class two into a class one. That's very difficult to do. I, I do not envy the orthodontist and what their challenges are. Uh, so Kay has a significant horizontal slide. And when she went laterally, she was nowhere near her front teeth uh, for guidance, for anterior guidance. Well, here's the splint I made her. It took me months to get the splint to this point and to get her comfortable. Uh, and anyway, that is a pretty normal looking splint, I would say, in my practice. Uh, whether it looks like a class two or class one, uh, it's difficult to tell oftentimes. It has to do with the dots and lines and we're having some guidance from the back teeth to the front. So my goal for K was to do the least amount of dentistry and achieve comfort for her so that she could chew food again and so she could get back into school and not have all these horrific headaches she had. So uh, looking at this, uh, again, in the treatment planning process, which is real critical, is to do the least amount of dentistry, I decided what I wanted to test out. I could have tested out a class one splint. Well, that would have been really hard to the dentist had been working on it for three years to get her there. She would need massive amounts of dentistry and surgery. Her profile was already slightly onathic, so she didn't want her mandible advanced. Her. She would have had to cut her chin back to do it. And anyway, here's this splint in her mouth. And if you look, you'll see that the splint represents very similar to her maximum intercuspation. So that's why we like to look at what the patient presents with, where they go in their own acquired bite. So we have similar uh, interocclusal distance between the teeth and the splint on the left and right side. Here's her right lateral movements. And so I, I is the, her on the right is after I had equilibrated her to the teeth, same as the splint, and the picture on, and here we are in our left lateral movement, and here's the splint again. Now you can see where the teeth are actually drawn on there. Uh, that is, I, I typically don't draw on the splints themselves. That's where I just overlaid tronically on this one. The idea of what I'm doing. And here we are with the teeth again. And we'll move to the final uh, teeth. And I've got to shrink a little bit here so I can see. Right. There we go. All right. So uh, I added composite on the upper left bicuspids and I had a composite on the molar. I did some very limited reduction on her posterior teeth. So I actually almost flattened these occlusal tables and the splint told me to do that. I needed to create guidance on that splint. And when we look at that splint again and compare it to the teeth, we can see that here's those left bicuspids. And so I created the same type of guidance there and on her molar. Uh, and she does wear a splint that night still so, because in the far excursive interference or guide planes, because I did not equilibrate her teeth. So splint design, again, lose the muscle, you can do, uh, use it for restorative skill verification, and then you have different types of splints that are full coverage, the universal splint or tanner splint. The difference between them is that the tanner is more anatomical. Both achieve a lot of things, and it all depends what you want to learn from this one. Uh, this is my mentor, my dental father, I call him. Uh, I met Rich Green, Dr. Rich Green, at the Panky Institute in 1996, and uh, he's guided me through all the way to this point, and uh, he's kept his arm on my shoulder, even though I'm trying to get my arm over his shoulders. 
uh, someday. But uh, anyway, please, I want to just uh, say thank you very rich because a lot of people out there who uh, I've studied with and uh, they're directly no rich and started a, a lot of good study groups for all of us. So thanks, Rich. Um, anyway, Rich was very fond of uh, talking about Dr. Pankey and I'll read this to you. I remember hearing it after many young dentists working hard to understand new concepts. He would come into the classroom to spend some time with them. As he was introduced, he would walk up to the front of the room with a smile on his face and a twinkle in his eye, asking a question of the group. So what's so hard about occlusion? He'd pause the room with a murmur. All you have to do is have as many teeth as possible contact lightly and simultaneously in centered closure. And when power is applied, neither teeth nor jaw deflect. When the jaw moves forward and back or side to side, no back tooth will touch before, harder than, or after a front tooth. And that's occlusion. He'd pause, smile, had a twinkle in his eye. And we just spend the rest of our lives working that out with and for each patient who sits in our patients, who sits in our chair on a uniquely individualized basis and accord with the patient's circumstances, objectives, and temper. That's it all in a nutshell for you. We'll review this uh, definition of occlusion as we go through the C cases. So what's with Engels classifications? Class one, um, this, this stuff first of all, is defined in 1899 by Engel, in the Dental Cosmos, that was the big journal of the day. Well, basically uh, many studies have been done about different types of occlusions and whatnot, and in essence, uh, and we can talk all day about studies, uh, but we're not. Uh, there, there is no one occlusion that is the best. Engel's uh, classifications do have practical utility. It helps us speak to each other, and there's reasons that we like Engels. That's one. So normal occlusion, that's what Engel called normal. Uh, and everything else, by the way, was malocclusion. It wasn't class one, it was malocclusion. But I do believe that other uh, angles classifications are more difficult to treat. So here's kind of a mangled up class one case, and so it's malocclusion according to angle. And here's class two malocclusion just simply because it's class two. Well, why is class two so much more difficult to treat? Why do these patients have more problems? Well, when when we uh, move our jaws laterally in a class one, a a classic class one, the mandible will move more anteriorly. The guide planes and the movements move the mandible forward. That keeps the pressure away from the TMJ joint. So the muscles don't have to overreact. Uh, the joints are very happy and comfortable in a class two. So there's the mandible going forward in a class two. When we move laterally, if we have restored a cuspid or an anterior teeth too much on its distal surface, distal guide plane in, in lateral movement, or if some orthodontics didn't quite work out the way we wanted, the mandible can be distalized it's back into the jaw joint. That's where the problems exist. A lot of problems exist in occlusion and including when you cement your crowns because of distalizing forces. Look for those in your patients when you're wondering why they keep complaining about a crown or something is wrong. I, very often, uh, it's just as simple as looking for how the mandible is being pushed. What about class threes? For now, I'll just say they're basically a class one that's upside down, and I hope I didn't insult anybody with that. Uh, but uh, they're, they're often easier to treat. They're very adapted to patients. So, occlusal splint therapy, what's so great about it? It's diagnostic and co-educational. You learn about the patient, they learn about their condition, and it helps them. Uh, it's therapeutic, it's preventive. It helps evaluate the effects that fulfilling the requirements of occlusion has on the somatic nathic system. You're testing it out. You're evaluating centric occlusion and verifying that position. It's reversible. That's the beauty of it. You can do all kinds of things you want, so don't be afraid to start doing different things with your foot, test things out. So uh, Jeannie is a friend of mine from childhood, and uh, when I uh, would see her, I would tell her, hey, you really should be wearing a splint because I know you injured your jaw when you were a kid and your jaw's a little sideways. And uh, she just kind of poo-pooed, it's ah, fine, I don't have that many problems. And she, she wasn't symptomatic, but she would chew popcorn 
and bite on those little hard unpopped kernels and uh, you can see how deviated her chin is due to one condyle ascending ramus is shorter than the other. And so here's Jeannie's maximum intercuspation and she called and finally came in for treatment because she said she was in horrific pain and she had been in into one of those little hard popcorn kernels and put too much pressure on her jaw joint. So, and if you look at this picture closely, you'll see her tongue is pushing out on the left side. That's what her splint is. She's adapted. A lot of people will use their tongues to adapt. That's a nice splint. Uh, so here's Janie's uh, centric occlusion. And here's the splint I made. This was made originally in 1995 or six. It was, uh, I had been down at the Pink Institute and for, uh, I was very fortunate that Mark Piper and Henry Gramion were there that week. And uh, so uh, Dr. Gramion helped guide me through making my splint. And the picture you see below is a little different than what I originally placed in her mouth uh, because I modified it a little bit. And when I modify my splints, just for those of you who are wondering how do you get these things paid for, I tell my patients, just like software, I'm giving them an upgrade. So I just have to keep upgrading it. If some adjustments, it's an upgrade. So that's how you can get paid for these things. Uh, so goals of splint therapy, it has to be comfortable to the tissue. It re has repeatable balanced contacts of equal intensity. We call them bullseyes at light closure. We'll talk more about that later. There's no deviation upon firm closure and smooth guidance. Again, that, that word smooth, I'll repeat a few times about all movements. There's gotta be comfort in the joints and muscles after prolonged use. Here's another case, uh, obviously uh, somebody with a very uh, retronathic mandible. Uh, so Megan was in severe pain, she didn't have money. She, uh, her aunt was taking care of her, asked me if I could help her out. And I said, well, I'll, I, I'll see what we can do. So of course I tried making a splint. She, there was, certainly this is a, an orthonathic case. Uh, we don't have to uh, wonder why I would say that probably. But uh, anyway, the, the same formula is used. We went through a comprehensive examination and I wanted to, just make sure I could get her comfortable. Well, she also needed to wear something during the day, so I had to make something as small as possible. Here's her centric occlusion, basically on her back molars, all the way in the back. None of those teeth are touching. You can't even see what's there. And here's her maximum intercuspation. That's as far as she could close the mouth. That's how I had to take my bite record. That's the splint. She wore that for three, four years. I forget how many years it was before she was able to get out of school, have insurance and get her surgery done. So that's what the splint looked like. It doesn't look pretty, just like my friend, Dr. Todd Davis's golf swing, but it worked. And that's, I just was paying attention to how her muscles work. That's why those red marks are like that. They're not your classic dots and lines. So orthodontic surgery and orthodontics was done, and we followed this in principles of having good guidance. And this is just movements, protrusive movements, lateral movements. And this was Megan before and Megan after. And there's a, a market change in her comfort and happiness. So very centric contact distributions and eccentric movements can be evaluated by the clinician and patient prior to any alteration to the natural condition. That's what this is about, doing it prior to the alterations. And uh, by the way, that article was cited from Dr. Tim Delina, who any of those who uh, know him, uh, he passed recently, so a few prayers for him. Uh, splint design. We have prototype occlusion with uh, is what I'm talking about when we're deciding to do changes in anatomy and cadence. And that's where what I'll call the Tanner split comes in. So we can use a Tanner splint for angles class one, two, and three. You don't have to use the Tanner splint, but uh, it certainly gives you a little more information than an anterior to program, or it gives you more information than a typical universal flat thing. So, Here's our different types of splints. This is a uh, summary, basically, of the differences in these the things and when you can use them. So an anterior to program, they're really easy to use. I use them all the time. For patients with simple problems, I just may take a, uh, an anterior segment 
a, a tray and have them wear that, put some acrylic in it, uh, fabricate within an hour while they're waiting, and uh, they wear they can wear that for an indefinite period of time to get them out of pain until you're ready to move forward with treatment. Or it may be enough for them uh, as far as any taking care of any of their symptoms. So universal uh, appliance is a little more moderately difficult to make. And a tanner is definitely more difficult. There's more uh, nuances to that. They all can provide pain relief. They the anterior program may verify seal. The universal and the tanner, you can verify seal because over time you can get repeated contact points. The anterior program is basically no prototype. Universal, you can get some things done with it, especially you can work out some anterior guidance on a universal splint, some centric steps, and the tanner is a more anatomical. Oh, another reason why I like tanner splints or anatomical splints, because in these class two bites, which are a lot of my patients, they can wear these things during the day. It, it, they are thinner and they're not obtrusive. And the patients feel comfortable wearing them because nobody can see them in their mouths, so they don't feel uh, encumbered by them. So, sorry, uh, both are universal and tanner. You can get CO verification, flat plane, one's bulky, one's thin, and I really like working out the anterior guidance, which will move into tanner splints. So what I'd like you to do, if you don't mind, humor me, like I can't see any of you, but stand up on your two feet and you be balanced. And I'm gonna stand up too, but just so I'm doing this. But then lift one leg off the ground and you'll feel that you have to recruit more muscles. Well, that's like when you're on one front tooth. You gotta recruit more muscles possibly to balance. Now stand up on your tiptoes on that foot while your other foot's in the air. That's even a lot harder. You may even, some of you hopefully didn't fall down. So uh, that's recruiting a lot of muscles and it's very difficult. Well, that's what people are doing on their front teeth often. And that's sometimes we cause that when we put restorative dentistry there or when we move teeth orthodontically, we need to make sure people don't need to recruit a lot of muscles to be stable on their edges. So uh, by the way, Dr. Todd with the golf swing, uh, these are, he, he put a lot of work into these a number of years ago, and so I, he was kind enough to let me use these, and I adapted them. Uh, anyway, so pitch is what we were just talking about. The pitch is that balance when you're on your edges. The leading edge is what, on a mandibular tooth, is facial surface. The trailing edge is on the lingual surface. So here we are actually on teeth, we can look at. And so the pitch is that top of the tooth. So that's where your opposing teeth need to be back to it. There are your leading edges, your trailing edges. So now we have some movement and we can see how that works in movement. And again, finding these positions, the leading edges, the pitch, and the trailing edges. And so we want to be able to transfer the learning from our splint. So this is where the tanner splint comes in. Uh, good use, and you can do this, you can modify your universal splints as well. Um, so we have our leading edge, our pitch, and our training edge. And so think of that splint as the tooth. And then the splint is basically a tanner splint, and I encourage you to make sure they're thin. That it's generally they're going to be no thicker than two millimeters anywhere, so they just, you're just overlapping, you're coating the teeth with the splint and you're just changing the occlusal design on them to test out your changes in anatomy on the teeth. You may consider whether you have to add composite or restore a tooth or reduce teeth or orthodontically move. So just another uh, way of looking at things, if you bevel on your teeth, that's a maxillary tooth. Everything needs to be smooth. So here's another definition. Occlusion. It's no different than a regular occlusion. Read that if you like, want, and uh, we want the excursive movement on the most appropriate forward tooth. That's something to focus on. It doesn't have to be an anterior tooth to have anterior guidance. Start on a posterior tooth. So here's some literature that I'll just read through, but he says that. Um, you really shouldn't change occlusal schemes unless you need to. 
you don't need to change what a person comes in with unless there's pathology. Just because there's a balancing contact does not mean it's pathologic. You like the patient the way they are when the patient is healthy. And if so, do not change the angles classification. But you may want to alter the angles classification classification if the patient has pathology, signs, or symptoms. This allows the patient to experience occlusal alterations in a reversible manner when you use splint therapy. So here's our class one, and that's a class one splint. We have anterior coupling. We have anterior coupling of the teeth and of the splint. So that's typically what a splint would look like. Again, this is a tanner. The difference in a just a universal, you wouldn't see these concavities in the back teeth. It just this thinner. That's why those concavities are there, just like it. Okay, so again, here's our definition of occlusion. And what we want on these splints is balance left and right. We want equal intensity stops in the posterior areas. We want bullseyes there. How do you get bullseyes? Bullseyes are the clear spots, by the way, in the center of the splint. Uh, or in the center of those posterior green marks. So have the patient close lightly, and I use Madam Butterfly uh, paper, it's 90 microns thick. It's very light paper. So have them close lightly two times, then remove the articulating paper and have the patient close once more. That closing once more is actually shows you where the contact point is. The thickness of the paper will smear. The clear spot is actually the contact point. Listen for resonance. So you can take, if you're wondering which side is higher than the other, you can take out the paper on one side. The side that's muffled is the high side. Doing equilibration on teeth and on splints is like fine tuning an instrument. When you have equal intensity contacts or equal intensity notes on an instrument, volume goes up, the amplitude is raised. So Outer. Avoid inclines on these, meaning your contacts, when they're hitting on these centric stops, you don't want to be distalizing the mandible. Use a preet wheel for fine reduction. The bullseyes, again, are the high spots. So I'm not using an acrylic burr on these things. I'm using a preet wheel. I'm using very fine wheels when I'm polishing these. So here's uh, different types of articulating paper. And again, if I'm having something um, where I, I'm doing gross adjustments, I'll use thicker paper, like uh, about 200 micron thick. When I'm doing lighter contacts, when I'm re refining, I get to my thinner paper. So that gets us to the T-scan. I know some people are really like these. Well, um, I'm, I'm not somebody who wants to use it. Um, because it's another thing I'd have to buy and then sit there and look at, look at what the reports say and this and that. And uh, it's fine. I think they have pr very good practical use and they're probably very helpful in uh, learning things, but the thickness of their, what you have to put in the patient's mouth is too thick for fine adjustments. So I've seen people adjusted, patients of mine who had T-scan adjustments done, well, they weren't adjusted to the fineness that they needed to be adjusted to. So that's all I'll say about it. So I think you can take use a TK scan up to a certain point. There are some things I'm sure some of you have learned to use it for other things, but I do not I have not seen at least that it be used for fine adjustments. So uh, why would a T scan work? Or why does anything work? Why does orthodontic work on most patients? Well you have adapters. Some people are just real good adapters. But for the highly sensitive people you, you, you are um, playing with fire sometimes when, you, when you're not uh, refining things to the degree. When you start changing their occlusions on a high sensor and you didn't do a splint, you may be changing that occlusion for free for a long time. Ask me how I know. <laughs> uh, that was in my younger days. But anyway, uh, here's a class one splint. And if we took out, if I had made that a class two, maybe I want to, maybe I want to test something out for some reason. Well, that would be a class two if I didn't have coupling on my splint. So don't use a class two splint on a class one patient if that's how you're going to finish them. And here we go back to Kay's case. Here's her class two splint. And um, 
we can, if, if with case case, if I wanted to test class one, I could have filled that in and had anterior cup. So uh, these are just more research. I won't spend a lot of time here on this. Um, and it's just basically saying there's no one superior type of occlusion. You can read literature, uh, and study this in EMD activity. Uh, there's so many different, uh, um, I would just say, variables in these studies and who took who did the studies and on what patients, et cetera, that it really, uh, you can skew your data in different ways to get the result you want in your study. Uh, there are very good studies out there, but uh, many of them are somewhat biased. So again, just more literature, we'll keep going through. So how steep do we make our splints? How do we decide steepness? Well, if you're going uphill, on something that takes more muscle recruiting. If you're going downhill, usually less muscle. So that's something to consider when you're thinking about muscles. So when I'm making my splint in my lab, we look at the rise of the natural teeth off the incisal guide table and then compare it to the rise with the splint in. And we try to get the splint to not be greater than that, unless, of course, we're trying to just put somebody into a change. So we're mimicking what they start with or reducing the splint. On the left, we have the natural teeth. On the right, we have the swell. So generally, you don't want to increase the steepness. Uh, you, when you're doing the uh, adjustments in the patient's mouth, just ask the patient to kind of move their jaw side to side and ask them which side's easier. Then work on the side that's harder to work, and you're engaging them in the process, and they're willing to keep moving forward with you. And they're going, oh, that feels better. Oh, that feels better. They, as you reduce one side, and then they'll say, now the other side hurts. Now the other side hurts. Eventually, you'll get them both to a point where they're happy. But they're learning, and they're learning. So we, uh, we like to term that listening to the muscles, really paying attention to them. Again, thinking about your flat feet versus being on your tiptoes. You don't want quivering. You don't want the circulation of the muscles. You want them to be comfortable and constrained. Evaluate everything at the extreme movements with your splints. People go into those extreme over movements. Okay, so here's our definition again. So you don't want to, it's light closure. Always light closure. That's where I want you to be thinking. When you're first, when you're getting to the fine refinements, it's at light closure. That's where things have to be timing. So when we're in our uh, last two pace, we have our side planes that start from the back, the transition, and we want to go as quickly as forward to the front. So in our class two, we start in the back, we move forward to the class one. And uh, now class one, basically class two becomes a class one once they're on the front teeth. And the stroke, stroke length is relative to the stroke, stroke length on the natural teeth. So how smooth is it? Well, you can see scratches on these things. So when a patient says, hey, I don't want you to equilibrate my teeth, and you're looking at their teeth, and they're all sharp and jagged, you can start pointing out on the splint where these sharp spots are. And this was one of those particular patients, and so I took pictures of it, and I said, hey, this is why. I mean, I knew why when I first saw the patient, but the patient didn't care to move forward with equilibration. They were very hesitant about me grinding on their teeth. Uh, and anyway, so. Finally, after seeing this for several months, the patient said, all right, I get it. Let's go ahead and start fixing my teeth. So your goal is to educate the patient and get them to ask you for the treatment. Keep pearls, look for ditches. They cause distalizing forces, feel for fremitus. Listen and watch the muscles for fasciculation. Ask to proceed or have the patient ask you to proceed with treatment. Uh, adjective resumes, uh, regimens acupuncture, myofascial therapy, physical therapy, they all can help. Uh, warm comp compresses, alternating with cold. Cold help really when there's acute trauma, otherwise warm compresses help break down lactic acid. I do use some, uh, on the severe cases, some people do need, this is like putting out fires with Valium milligrams, is psychogenic, it is not addictive at that level, and it acts as a muscle relaxer at two milligrams. Quetrel, far stronger, it's for bedtime use, one hour before Botox works great. Love using Botox on some people. Uh, they're just, they, they just cannot stop clenching. Those muscles, I don't care how good their bite is, if they're gonna clench because they're stressed and they're on some uh, serotonin inhibitor uptake uh, drugs, they will be clenching. Botox works great. Uh, we're getting to a very interesting case. Peter uh, was 
very, uh, he had no symptoms. He was very healthy, but did not like his bite at all. I'm waiting years. Well, oh, did you notice that's upside down? Yeah. Well, anyway, he's a class three. That's his bite. Look at those posterior teeth. He's got ankylosed primary teeth. Uh, yet he is in no pain. So what does this tell me about Peter? He's an adapter. This guy, I mean, I'm going, wow. He's, you know, other people are saying, hey, you need surgery. You got to do this. It's jaw surgery. And Peter's going, I don't want jaw surgery. I like the way I look. I just want my teeth fixed. And so um, uh, a dentist who lives in the UK, thank you, Raj, referred him to me. I don't know how they know each other in Chicago and what, but Raj gets around everywhere. So anyway, uh, Peter, uh, we, uh, I told Peter, I said, I don't know what you're going to be able to tolerate. So let's test this out. I, I have a way we can test it out. And if it works, if you make it through the splint therapy, we can proceed forward. So that was Peter's CO. He basically uh, did get basically edged, edged. So his class three was actually a protruded movement. He's kind of a pseudo class three. And then that's his chewing position. Uh, he's an adapter. I said, how do you chew food? He said, right here. He chews on his front teeth. So maybe that should be added to the uh, JPD terminology of prosthodontic terms. And uh, so here, here's his bite again, and my markups are kind of my uh, sketched out treatment plan, just a rough draft of what I'm doing. And so I want to find the most predictable treatment with the least amount of dentistry that meets the patient's individual needs. He could have surgery, he could have a whole mouth of new crowns and all kinds of things. And we're trying to do these things for him. He wants to uh, eliminate his underbite. He, he didn't mind his aesthetics that much. He just said, hey, uh, these, I want to look a little better, but he wasn't looking to be uh, making movies in Hollywood or anything. So he had limited uh, aesthetic needs, but he wanted longevity and function, comfort and health. So th there's his CO again. So this was the quickest, quickest wax up I ever did on a full case presentation, just simply because he didn't want to spend a lot of money. I didn't want to spend a lot of money and time for on doing his wax up. So I just used rope wax back there and my first thing, because I wanted to know if the splint would work. We weren't going anywhere without a splint. So from that wax up, I made a splint. I put that in his mouth. This was his 24 seven splint. He wore that thing. I said, you got to eat with this. Well, he came back in a couple of weeks and he said, I said, so did you wear 24 seven? He said, yeah. I said, did you eat with it? He said, well, a couple of times. And so uh, he said he really didn't like, he was comfortable, but he figured out, he, he tested it out. He felt comfortable. He said, let's go forward with treatment. So well, that's his splint guiding back and forth. Uh, this is just, I won't show the whole case of all the steps, but these are some of his provisionals. So I'm still now changing his splint into his, uh, onto his teeth and making provisionals. And so here I was maintaining some centric stops in the back teeth and saying, okay, I'm still gonna have to open them up a little from here when I do the posterior teeth. But here's his uh, provisionals in place. He doesn't have his implants in yet. And uh, here he is with uh, implants in, I think, at this time, not sure. But anyway, that's his splint. We converted his splint to this now with his temporaries. So uh, there's his implants and here's teeth. And he, you know, he, as I said, he didn't care that much about the aesthetics. He didn't even show his lower teeth. So that's why those two lower teeth aren't done. He wanted the least amount of dentistry and keep the money under control. So here's Peter in occlusion. And here's our, I, I'd like you to focus on the second half of this. Not all healthy occlusions look the same and are dependent on the adaptive capability of the patient. A non-stressed imperfect occlusion or imperfect occlusion may be preferable over an overused ideal occlusion. How a patient uses their teeth is equally important as their occlusal arrangement. So summary. Occlusal splint therapy, diagnostic co-educational, and basically transfer your learning to your final restorative group. You're not making mistakes. You're not trying hard enough. So it's okay. Make some mistakes. You'll learn by trying different things. You, you need to work this out in your splint before you go to the mouth. And thank you. Uh, that's Henry Tanner with Rich Green. There are sternum peckers. That's what you need. I advise you strongly to find some mentors in your life and have them peck your sternum. And the group to my right is uh, just one of our uh, study groups. Uh, and hello to you all from the Milwaukee study group. And thank you, thank you. And if you need to contact me, there's my information.